Hello and welcome everyone to the last in our series in the 2015 All Bugs Good and Bad webinars. I appreciate you all dialing in. I'm Danny Kale and along with Mike McQueen, Regional Extension Agents with Alabama Extension, we're going to be moderating this webinar today. Um, you're going to see the chat box at the left, so if you have questions during the webinar, you can go ahead and type those in and we'll take some uh, time at the end for those questions. We'll also have a few survey questions at the end that we would like for you to answer, so that will help us with future webinars. And again, thanks to all who are helping in the chat box and the social, social media today. And we would like to welcome Dr. Scott Hingstrom. He is with the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point in 2014 as the Douglas R. Stevens Endowed Chair in Wildlife and also the Director of the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife. He led the creation of the Internet Center for Wildlife Damage Management and the e-extension community of practice in the wildlife damage management. He is lead editor of the book Prevention and Control of Wildlife Damage and co-editor of the National Wildlife Control Training Program. So we would like to welcome him today. He is we are very pleased to hear his presentation on wildlife in the backyard, a double-edged sword. Thank you, Dr. Hingstrom. Well, thank you, Danny. I do appreciate it. And, and I thank eExtension and the communities of practice, all the people involved in, in having me on today. This, I believe, is my third webinar that I've done for eExtension. I've done them on uh, bats and deer in the past, and I've enjoyed every one of them. And so I was uh, kind of excited to be able to do another one. Um, if you're wondering, that's me down in the bottom left, uh, along with one of my puppies, Abby, and it's in my backyard. And so you can see that I kind of live and breathe this stuff, uh, this wildlife. And, uh, and so I'm always excited to be able to talk about wildlife. So this idea of uh, wildlife being a double-edged sword, what are we talking about there? Well, you know, I think everybody loves wildlife. And uh, we could talk about this from the perspective of the colorful birds at the bird feeders that we have, of the bunnies bouncing around in the backyards, and of those crazy squirrels and the antics that they, that they uh, provide us. Um, but wildlife provide us many benefits, from ecological, aesthetic, economic, scientific. There are many benefits. So we, we benefit immensely, and, and they, they add to our lives. But not as all bliss in the backyard. Uh, there are problems associated with wildlife sometimes. And so, for example, when you do feed birds, uh, oftentimes seed is spilled on the ground, and sometimes that attracts unwanted animals. And in this case, this is an image of voles uh, or field mice, meadow mice. There's a little rodents that will be attracted to those seeds, and then they tear up the turf in their processes, and, and they can cause damage like this. You know, those bouncing bunnies, well, they have to feed on something, and if it happens to be flowers in your flower beds, well, then you have a problem. And then those crazy squirrels, sometimes they find their way, their way into our homes and sheds and garages and structures, and they can chew up on eaves, and they can chew on electrical wiring, and they can cause all kinds of problems. And so that's why we talk about wildlife as being a double-edged sword. They kind of cut both ways. And so the goal that, that I have for this uh, presentation today is, is really twofold. Uh, number one, I want to talk about attracting wildlife to our backyards because they are so fun and fascinating. Um, but I also want to talk about how you can prevent and control the damage that those wildlife can cause. And so uh, much of the presentation will be focused on number two because this is a, a webinar that's focusing on our problem uh, species and pest species. But I want to plug in some of the positives about wildlife and enhancing as well. So for starters, with attracting wildlife to your backyard, it really comes down to planning. What, where, and how. Um, and if you put a little thought to this, uh, if you sketch out your property, something like this, spend a little time viewing your backyard and your surrounding area, spend a little time thinking about what you really want in your backyard uh, as far as the landscaping and as far as the wildlife that will respond to it, um, you can really help to direct what, what occurs in your backyard. And you can really enjoy it if you spend some time planning and you can make this a family activity. You get your kids involved, and it gets people, your kids, yourselves outdoors to enjoy nature and what's out there. Uh, it can be really a positive activity. 
Um, I think also with this planning is you have to figure out what's out there. And so if you're really detailed, you can actually develop an inventory. And again, you can take your kids out and spend some time out in the backyard and, and in the surrounding area and see what's out there as far as wildlife goes. You know, the colorful, bo- colorful birds, see what happens to be flying around. Uh, you know, the smaller mammals that might be occupying the trees or the backyard areas. Um, we also have the pollinator species, the butterflies and bees and such that uh, really can add a lot of visual attractiveness to our backyards. And then you don't want to herp, uh, forget about those herps, the uh, the various frogs and toads and other animals that, that are out there as well. So getting an idea of the potential of your backyard is, is kind of where we're going with this. Um, as far as attracting backyard wildlife, uh, where can you do it? Well, I think you can do it anywhere. It doesn't matter if you live in a downtown uh, studio apartment or in a sprawling suburban area. It doesn't matter if you live in Tucson, Arizona, or Portland, Maine. You can attract wildlife to your backyard. And so there are a variety of opportunities and and, uh, techniques that we can use in attracting wildlife. And that's where we go to the how. And I'll make it just as simple as this. If you provide food, water, and shelter, they will come. The wildlife will show up. And so here you see two images of of, uh, people's backyards and where they've provided food. And you can see the water that they've provided. And there's shelter that's provided for wildlife. And I can guarantee you that wildlife, well, in one shape or another, where it be birds or herpetofauna or whatever, they're going to be using a backyard setting like this. Now, it takes some effort to create a landscape of this nature, and that's kind of where the planning comes in. But there also are some small things you can do to improve your backyard, wherever you may be. So water, it is you know the essential material of life, and so water can be a great place to start as far as attracting wildlife to a backyard, and it may just be a matter of a bird bath in the back, and uh, that water just itself can can add attractiveness to a backyard. We can also go to the food side of the thing uh, with providing bird feeders, uh, uh, and and there are are tens of millions of people in the United States that feed birds. Uh, People really enjoy the activity. It brings color to the backyards and people's lives, and so it can be really an exciting thing for people to do. If you want even to add a little more color and activity to a backyard, put in a hummingbird feeder. Look at the beautiful color associated with that and the ruby-throated hummingbird on the right, and they buzz around. Fascinating stuff that you can draw to a backyard. Um, adding the shelter, some people really like to do hands-on activities. You can provide, you can build, and then provide birdhouses for for a variety of different birds that are out there. And there are plans for all of these different uh, devices out uh, online at various state wildlife agencies. And some people are adventurous; they want to uh, try and attract some different uh, wildlife have a diversity of wildlife in the backyard. So here's an image in the bottom left of a bat house. And so you can uh, create a bat house with the baffles inside and attract bats. And, and really, most of these wildlife are, are very beneficial. They can provide us many positives in bats. For example, insect control. They can control and, and feed on uh, a variety of mosquitoes and many other pest insects. So they can provide us many different positive benefits. So moving now on to this idea of, 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 of focusing on prevention and control of wildlife damage, I'm going to just kind of subtitle that living with wildlife. We need to find ways in which we can coexist with wildlife. And so I'll step us right back to, to stage one, and that being planning, what, where, and how. Um, and again, we can do this by sketching it out, getting outside, figuring things out, and, and essentially trying to provide some barriers between wildlife because we don't want them living in our houses or in our structures. We'd be happy to have them nearby, but not to the point where they're in or causing damage to those uh, pieces of personal property that that we value. Um, We'll start with this issue about what, what wildlife can cause problems. And and here's a a little scenario of of what I kind of consider maybe our top five (laughs) violators, if you will. And and these animals aren't always causing problems. It's just that these are probably the five that I get most of the calls in as far as species of wildlife that cause problems. Um, 
the little fellow on the left is a vole. Uh, this one's a meadow vole. And these guys, uh, they're a rodent. They're a native species. They were here long before we were, but they're a rodent. So therefore, they have those chewing teeth, and they will chew on things, and they can cause some damage in backyards, and they can girdle trees and shrubs, and they can be an issue if they become overabundant. The fellow over on the right, you can see, is a tree squirrel, and uh, the variety of tree squirrels, gray squirrels, fox squirrels, etc. Um, we do get a lot of calls of these because oftentimes they can become home invaders. They will chew a hole in uh, an eave or an attic point, uh, a peak in an attic, and they'll get access, and they may nest within an attic. They may chew up the area, getting into wires, all kinds of problems. So we get a lot of calls on tree squirrels. Um, down on the right, the cottontail, cottontail rabbits. Uh, these are um, pretty innocuous creatures, uh, but they do tend to feed on things that oftentimes those are things that we value. You know, trees that we recently plant, they'll nip the leaders off. Uh, garden vegetables, they'll, they'll just go right down the garden. They'll mow off new greens as they're coming up. The raccoons, they can provide a, a <laughs> do a lot of different problems, provide a lot of different problems, a lot of damage. They're pretty powerful, strong adaptable, opportunistic creatures, and they have some dexterity in those front feet, and so they can actually get into some things that you might not expect that uh, that they would cause problems with. And then over on the, the fifth one on the left, uh, the snakes. And in general, snakes. Uh, this one happens to be a garter snake, but but uh, and it's not so much that ca snakes cause damage; they really don't. Uh, the only exception would be the venomous snakes that we have in various parts of the United States. But the vast, vast majority of the snakes are non-venomous. They couldn't hurt us a bit, and we're much, much larger than them. But people still fear snakes. Uh, for the scientific term, it's ophidophobia, and people just have a fear, uh, in general, of snakes. Some people love them, but the, but the, most people, you know, they're nervous. And, and I like snakes myself, but I don't like stepping on them. You know, they can give you the heebie-jeebies when you, you step out off the porch, and they're, whoa, there's one. Um, and so, well, we, we try to probably find a way of living with snakes so that they're not too close to what the buildings and the uh, structures that we occupy. Snakes are really beneficial creatures. They, they are an important part of the ecosystem. Um, but we, that doesn't mean that we have to live with them in our houses. And so we just try and keep them at bay. So those are the top five, I'll say. But there are many, many others. And it kind of depends upon where you're from. Here are some others. Uh, we have some winged creatures that can move about quite a lot uh, with starlings and Canada geese, which can cause problems in, in people's backyards. Uh, we have some that don't move so much. We see the one at the top here, and I'm going to click on our arrow and pull that down for us. And we'll see... Right here, this creature, this is a mole. I mentioned a vole before, V-O-L-E, and this one is a mole, M-O-L-E. And they live probably 99% of the time below ground, and they're not that mobile, uh, but they put up, push up ridges in the surface of the soil, and they can cause problems with our turf grass. And they're just going about their daily lives trying to find food. That's what they do is they essentially swim through the soil trying to encounter earthworms and insects. Uh, and in doing so, they can cause some damage to our turf grass. Uh, this one is uh, just an evidence of uh, mole hills where they push up the mole, uh, these uh, these uh, mounds of earth. And, uh, you know, it can be unsightly. It can cause problems with mowing. Um, you know, all creatures great and small. Here we get some larger, uh, uh, some of the larger uh, creatures that can cause some damage. So we're talking about black bears, uh, which can be attracted to bird feeders, deer in the backyards. Yes, we're talking about larger creatures. And we have smaller ones like the chipmunks uh, and various other ground squirrels that can be problematic in people's yards. And then we have some that bring another element to the party uh, with the skunks and the, <laughs> the scent that they can release and the you know, the odors that they might, uh, that your pets might get involved with and if they happen to cause some problems. So uh, there are, as a wide variety of species that can cause some problems <clears throat> across the country. It all depends upon where you live and then the circumstance that, that uh, you provide for them. Moving further with, with this idea of living with wildlife, and we talk about where we might have problems and how, where we might have to deal with wildlife. Well, <clears throat> I think we can have wildlife anywhere, and so therefore we're going to have to deal with wildlife everywhere. Here we have an, an illustration of a, of a beautiful home, and we can see um, uh, that they've 
done some really nice work on landscaping this home. And, and what I want to do is kind of break down the, uh, the various components of, the, of this home, if you will. And so for starters, we have turf. We have turf grass that you need to be aware of. And there are various pests, wildlife, or problem wildlife species that can cause some damage with that t- turf. We can also look at the trees and shrubs that might be associated with this backyard. And now you're going to be dealing with different species that would cause damage to trees and shrubs, for the most part, as compared to those species that would be causing damage in the turf grass. We also have uh, this feature, the flowers, the flower beds that would be associated with a beautiful home like this. And yes, those flowers attract very positive species like the pollinators, the butterflies, and hummingbirds, etc. But they too, those flowers can serve as food and therefore can be an attractant to some of our unwanted visitors. And so this is a, a resource, I think, that we do need to consider protecting in, in our backyards. And another resource here that I would add would be the gardens. You know, there's a real movement now on as far as people gardening, the locavore movement, producing foods in a locally. And uh, so gardens can be tremendously valuable. And if you can imagine, if we can eat the produce that comes out of these gardens, so can a lot of other species. You know, rabbits come to mind, for example. They, they love garden, a uh, variety of vegetables and leafy, leafy greens, etc. And so you need to consider the various components that you're in, in your backyard and then how you might protect those. Um, if we look at the, uh, the management of wildlife in general, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to borrow from a term that, that they've used for, for decades in entomology, and that is integrated pest management. Um, but I modify it a little bit, and that I prefer to call it integrated wildlife management. And I, say, I do that because I'm a wildlife biologist. I really don't like having to consider wildlife being pests. You know, the vast majority of our wildlife are very, very beneficial. And so we'll call this integrated wildlife management. And, and I have kind of a working definition here that, that, that i just like to go through. And, and it applies, I think, very nicely. To me, integrated wildlife management, it's the timely use of a variety of environmentally safe, socially acceptable, and cost-effective methods to reduce damage to a tolerable level. That's a bit of a mouthful, but it's a lot shorter than many of the definitions I've seen for IBM. Um, and so just to, to touch upon this, the timely use. Um, there are certain times of the year in which your homes and gardens, etc., are going to be very vulnerable uh, to, to, say, for example, uh, rabbit damage coming into a garden. And so you want to time the protective activity uh, that you might have. For example, installing a small fence around a garden. You want to time that just before those uh, garden vegetables start emerging from the soil so you can protect them at that specific time. Um, If you have problems with uh, with bears at bird feeders in the summertime, well, bears are really hungry coming out uh, out of their denning season in the winter, in the early spring. If there are bird feeders out there and there's suet feeders, uh, boy, they will be attracted to them. So what do you do? You remove them. You remove those bird feeders and suet feeders, so you remove that attractive uh, uh, nature for the bears, and they won't appear. And so it's a matter of timing various activities. Uh, use of a variety of methods. Um, once we get into the how here further, we're going to explore more specific details on how you can prevent and control wildlife damage. And I will say that that in the world of dealing with wildlife, there are no silver bullets or magic potions that we can use. People would love to have something that they could just spray in their backyard and that would take care of all of the problems that they might have with wildlife. And unfortunately, we just don't have any single techniques that, that will work. I'd say usually. So so what we do is we'll prescribe a variety of techniques that you can employ that, that will work to help uh, reduce the damage to a tolerable level. Um, the techniques, the methods that we use, they must be environmentally safe, acceptable to the society, and they have to be cost-effective too. Um, and so these are some, some qualifiers that we make on the tools we use and so, for example, with the repellents uh, and even pesticides that we use for dealing with wildlife, they all must be registered by the Environmental Protection Agency. And that is one step in proving that these tools are environmentally safe. They go through a rigorous battery of testing to minimize any impacts to our environment, to our people, to our pets, to 
to any non-target animals that might be out there. And that lends itself to being socially acceptable if they are not harming other non-target animals. Um, and then last, I mentioned about here about reducing damage to a tolerable level. It's very, very difficult to eliminate damage. There are some cases, and I'll talk about those, but it's difficult to eliminate it. Oftentimes, more what we shoot for is to reducing damage to a level that people can accept and tolerate because there are so many benefits we have in dealing with wildlife. We sometimes can put up with a little damage that they might cause, a little loss of some flowers, things like that, uh, but yet we can enjoy the other benefits they provide. All right, so I'm going to move on then and talking with you about more in detail about how we deal with wildlife damage in our backyards. So this is where we get into more of the details on prevention and control of damage. Bird feeders. People love to feed birds. Uh, tens of millions of people do it every year in the United States, and they, they love the color, the, the, the activity that, that is out there in their backyards. Associated with the, the feeding of birds, though, um, you have... You know, the, I mentioned about the crazy squirrels. Well, they can jump on feeders. They will chew up feeders. They'll feed on all of the feed that's there before the birds get there. And uh, they can really cause some disruption <laughs> with bird feeders. And so, and, and it's so much so that uh, you even see that, that there are some polite squirrels out there in the world where they, oh, they're so sorry to bother you, but the bird feeder's empty. Um, we We need to find ways that we can address this issue about squirrels and, and bird feeders. I'll touch upon that in the very next next slide. There are some other species that are also involved with feeders, and you've seen these images already with the voles, V-O-L-E-S, the bears, raccoons. These are other species of wildlife that are attracted to these bird feeders, and so we have to figure out how to deal with those. So stepping back to the squirrels, there uh, is a quite a variety of squirrel-proof feeders that are out there and available on the market. Um, we see the one in the upper right is a cage that surrounds the bird feeder that allows birds in and is supposed to not allow squirrels in. But there are images of squirrels inside of these feeders. Uh, the one on the bottom left is a spring-loaded feeder. So the birds can perch where they are and they can reach in and nip out seeds. And the squirrels, they're heavier and so therefore they pull the spring down and it closes the opening door. Well, somehow squirrels figure out a way of, of defeating these as well. And there are many, many different types of feeders that are out there and available on the market. And I'd say that there is, as we mentioned before, no magic potion that's out there, no single tool or technique that's probably going to work. Um, I can say that, well, a a bird feeder suspended uh, from a string uh, is going to be somewhat squirrel-proof, but it won't eliminate access to all squirrels. A bird feeder uh, supported by a post from below will be pretty squirrel-proof, especially if you put a baffle around that post, but some squirrels are able to defeat those. So we have baffles and cones we can put on. We've got these spring-loaded and cages, and, you know, it's just a challenge in dealing with squirrels. There's an interesting book that was written, and the title is 101 Cunning Stratagems for Outwitting Squirrels. And then the subtitle was, You're Not Going to Be Able to Do It, so live with it. <laughs> uh, squirrels just have this capacity. But you try and do the best you can. Select some bird seeds. Uh, for example, safflower, se- safflower seed seems to be less attractive to squirrels. You can also select very small seed, like your um, uh, various thistle seeds, that uh, there's, the squirrels just have to take too much time feeding, uh, to, uh, working on those to, to be able to, to ingest them. You might also provide some alternatives to squirrels. For example, provide squirrels with ears of corn that are secured to a tree off to the side of the backyard so you can still observe the squirrels and enjoy them and their antics, and you can feed squirrels too and perhaps attract their attention away from your active bird feeders where you really like to see your birds present. So there's a lot of different things you can do with squirrels. None of them are foolproof, unfortunately. (laughs) Um, and so, oh, I should uh, just indicate here with this uh, squirrel up in the upper right, would you look at that, a new squirrel-proof bird feeder. Good, I was getting bored. <laughs> uh, the Internet is really great for some, some images. Um, a few other modifications that you might consider. Uh, the image that you see down here in the, uh, in the kind of central bottom, right down in here, you'll see <clears throat> is a bird feeder bird feeder here in which this individual has put a tray around underneath that bird feeder. 
Now, birds in general, when they're active on a bird feeder, they'll be flipping bird seed out and it falls on the ground. And that can become an attractant to voles and other small rodents. Um, and we want to try and avoid that. And here's a case where this individual has constructed a tray, essentially, that catches the seed so that it doesn't fall to the ground, thereby eliminating that source of, of attraction. Here's a case over on the right, if we take a look at this, where we see a bear up in a tree actually trying to get at a bird feeder. And uh, the problem that I see here is that it's, it's, uh, well, it's a little later on into the spring, but uh, birds, they emerge from denning uh, in, the, uh, the, uh, oh, in the spring and in my country about in March. And uh, they are very hungry at this time. And people, they have been feeding birds through the winter, and many people will continue feeding birds through March and April and May uh, because they just enjoy it and they're kind of in the habit of doing it. But if you live in the vicinity where bears, you know, where, where, where bears occupy, um, those bird feeders will be an attraction especially if you're using suet feeders. And so a way around this is to just remove those bird feeders before the birds, uh, before the bears emerge from their dens. Now, sometime in March, kind of depends upon your local area, but if you remove those bird feeders, you eliminate that attraction. And for the most part, these birds, if they've made it through the winter, they're, they're probably going to be able to do fine on their own, and they're really actually, they're going to normally be dispersing away from your bird feeder the way it is. Other people just love to feed birds continually through the summer and more power to them, so long as they're not prob having problems attracting, you know, unwanted guests like black bears to their backyards. <laughs> All right. Um, moving on then to another resource that we want to protect, and that would be our structures, our homes, our garages, our own buildings and sheds. And we have a situation I'd like to maybe just call your attention to this particular structure you can see that the, the landowner has done a beautiful job in landscaping this home. It's, you know, I'd love to live in a place like this. They have trees here and shrubs, and you can have some vines, climbing vines here. Uh, it's beautiful. There are some problems with having vegetation so closely located with a home, though, in that this vegetation provides shelter. It provides food for wildlife, and some of those wildlife can be unwanted. And so you notice how closely they've aligned the uh, shrubs here, easily providing access for squirrels to climb up onto an attic, get over here, chew their way into an eave, into an attic. Um, it's just providing, providing easy access to a home for squirrels and uh, raccoons, uh, animals that are climbers. So, for example, a way around this is to properly prune the trees back, oh, about 10 feet away from your existing structures. So here you can live with a tree in proximity to a home, but if you prune that tree roughly here, you eliminate the vegetation that allows the squirrels to jump over onto the house. And if it's about 10 feet away, you can pretty well uh, preclude the squirrels from getting on to, to a home. So just some simple pruning like that will help uh, immensely in keeping the squirrels at bay. If we look further um, and we, we look at our, our buildings, you notice on our beautiful home here, we have vegetation that's nicely placed up tight against the, the walls of that home. Um, but that can cause problems because we have animals like uh, house mice and Norway rats that are invasive creatures. And you can have those snakes that you don't want that close to the house. Uh, they can, you know, they have close access and close cover here. Well, a nice alternative is to apply uh, a rock bed here at the base of the home and that gives this visual barrier, if you will, uh, a kind of a stark-like environment that your rats and mice and snakes aren't going to like, and they're not going to occupy a place like this on stone. And then you see they have the nice visual, attractive uh, uh, shrubs. They're placed out here just outside of that barrier zone. And so you're getting both the visual appeal and uh, aesthetics of the landscape, but you're also not attracting wildlife immediately into the proximity of your, your building, where you might, if you left a window open, they could e easily get in. If you left a screen door open, in they go. And eventually some of these homes, especially the older homes, foundations crack. Uh, the sill plates will separate from the foundation walls, leaving openings that these animals can get immediately into the home. And then you have home invaders and you, you have some problems, which requires some repair. All right, lastly, um, if we go up top, uh, we were down at the bottom here before, but we go up top, uh, you know, many people will have chimneys associated with their homes. And these chimneys provide exceptional denning sites for raccoons. 
and other animals will use them as well. Tree squirrels, chimney swifts. I've even seen pileated woodpeckers fly down into these things. And so it behooves us to protect our, our, our structures by using chimney caps. Here's a nice screened chimney cap that you can place over. I would recommend uh, purchasing a, a manufactured screen uh, that has been approved um, because there are some details here. We don't want to have the screen mesh so tight that we could potentially plug this opening up and then the smoke uh, back flows down into the chimney causing uh, some potential human health hazards. Uh, most of these screens uh, are, are about half-inch mesh, and that is uh, kind of a, a, a concession in that we allow enough of that smoke and the, the fumes and vapors out uh, to allow that to escape, and yet we're able to exclude most of the animals that could get in to a, a chimney as such. So a chimney cap is a great move. They're relatively inexpensive, probably about $40 for a manufactured chimney cap. Um, you can crawl up there yourself or employ someone to go up and put a chimney cap on, and you can really eliminate that as a source of, of problems in the future. Uh, moving on then to another one of our resources we want to protect, uh, being the gardens. And so gardens, uh, we value those, the produce that come out of them, and so do rabbits. Uh, rabbits in particular can cause problems with gardens because they'll just go right down a, mow, a row and mow those off as far as new green leafies coming up or uh, peas, you know, a wide variety of crops they'll feed on. Rabbits, fortunately, are very successfully excluded by the use of fencing. Uh, and so you can take a, about a two-foot high fence, such as the one that you see here, <clears throat> and this this fence right here, uh, it's only about two feet high. It's using a welded wire type material. You can use poultry wire, any number of materials. Trench it down about four feet into the ground so the rabbits can't crawl under that fence, and you have a fence that's pretty much rabbit-proof. Rabbits aren't that interested in jumping over fences or trying to climb over. They just don't like doing that. And so, therefore, fencing really works wonders for protecting a garden. <clears throat> and it's really kind of one of the few single techniques that I can recommend that will eliminate damage. And that is for fencing for rabbits. Now, here's a, a fence that you see that's not too visually you know, obtrusive. Uh, people aren't going to be too worried about something like this. Uh, here's a case over on the left where people have invested more money. Uh, they've used some landscaping posts like this. They've put a structure on the bottom. It's a larger fence, so it looks like it's about a four-foot high fence. They put in gates like this, and so they, <clears throat> they actually made the fence somewhat ornamental or attractive in itself. There's even a kind of a gazebo-like structure back here, and I'm sure that's for, for climbing vines, for possibly for uh, you know, tomatoes or squash or peas, beans. And, and so the fenced garden itself becomes an attractive site in many people's eyes. And so it depends upon personal uh, preferences as to, to the extent that, that, that you go as far as fencing. Um, a last one on fencing that I have uh, is, is the use, and it's actually, a, I shouldn't say of fencing, but it's actually of netting. So we look over here on the right, and especially the netting works very effective with fruit crops. And so you may have small bush blueberries, or you may have plum trees or peach trees, things like that. And boy, squirrels can cause all kinds of problems. Birds will get into these uh, trees when the fruit are just starting to ripen, and they'll, in, they'll, they'll feed on them and ingest them directly, or they'll peck at them and they'll damage the fruit so they render it unuseful for our, our purposes. And so netting like this can be very effective in, uh, in controlling birds, squirrels, and, and even you can use netting to protect against deer. So they can be, uh, you know, wide uses for, for the effectiveness of, of netting. Uh, moving on then to uh, flower beds, kind of an extension of our gardens, but uh, flower beds aren't produce uh, aren't designed for producing food. They're produced uh, they're producing a visual attractiveness, the colors, the visual stimulation that they provide. And so there there are a variety of ways we can deal with flower beds, but we may not be so interested in putting up a four foot high woven wire fence around a flower bed kind of defeats the purpose of the aesthetics that the flower bed is providing. Other people don't mind. They don't mind using fencing, and if that's the case, and if they have rabbits, you could have a low foot and a half to two foot high fence around a flower bed. Works perfectly as far as excluding rabbits. Other people don't want to have that visual distraction, and so they go to repellents. Uh, these are chemical compounds that are designed to either uh, uh, 
taste bad or smell bad. Uh, they have different modes of action. Some of them stimulate uh, repellency by fear. And they actually smell like predator feces. And you can, or, or you can purchase coyote and fox urine, for that matter, that smell like predators. And the animals, rabbits, voles, ground squirrels, they might be fearful of that and move out of the area. Other repellents, they repel by, by taste. Uh, and es- essentially, they, they stimulate pain. Um, one of the active ingredients is, is capsaicin. It's essentially the active ingredient in hot sauce that we all put on our tacos and burritos. It's a secondary defense compound that's naturally produced to ward off herbivores. And what do we do? We eat it readily. Nonetheless, um, it can be sprayed on plants to protect them from, from uh, rabbits, and deer, and other animals that might, might be chewing on. You see hostas here. Uh, hostas are somewhat like deer candy, and so uh, repellent might be very effective and very helpful for, for warding off uh, an herbivore like that. One thing I will have to say, though, is, is sometimes repellents will work and sometimes they don't. It's, it depends upon how motivated the animals are, how hungry they are, and whether, what other alternatives they might have as to whether a repellent will work or not. Oftentimes it depends upon uh, if the repellent can easily be washed off. And so if it rains, you may have to reapply. Some of these have stickers, and they help to hold them longer. And so there's a variety of repellents out there. Go online. You can see hundreds of them, and, and, and many will work. Some won't. It's, it's a challenge as far as you know, having a great deal of confidence in, in repellents to, to ward off herbivores. Another approach you can take, such as this, is, is rather than going with the annual plants, uh, but it's, it's the plant of perennials. Many of our perennials actually have natural plant defense compounds. They're going to ward off herbivores because they evolved with these herbivores. And uh, they can provide uh, a, a dense uh, growth form and can provide a variety of colors throughout the season. And, and you also don't have to replant them <laughs> since they are perennials. And so uh, oftentimes going with a perennial type garden can be beneficial uh, in, in dealing with wildlife damage. The last one I have for you here is, is another mode of action it, uh, or another type of tool, and it's a frightening device. Now, you've all known of scarecrows, and people install scarecrows to ward off animals to keep them out of an area. Um, and this one happens to be a frightening device that's auditory. It produces a sound, and it's actually a deer distress call. That's what a deer distress call sounds like, and it's motion activated. And so it doesn't play until a deer crosses the beam. And then it plays that distress call, and it scares the deer away. And so it has nice applications for backyard settings, and this is a product, again, that's that's, uh, available out there online. I actually did research on this particular tool and found it to be very, very effective. Um, How about the lawns, the turf grass itself? Well, I mentioned about moles before, and moles can be problematic in pushing these ridges up like this. Molds are pretty unique creatures. Um, they live below ground 99% of the time, and unfortunately, trapping is probably the very best technique that we can use for dealing with moles. There are several different types of traps that are available that you can see here, and uh, all of these traps will work. It's just kind of which ones you get most familiar in using, and then knowing how to trap moles. And I won't, I'm not going to go through the details about how to increase your effectiveness, but by trapping the main runways that lead from the den up to those surface tunnels like this is where you're going to be most successful. And I'd suggest you look at some extension neb guides or, or I should say extension fact sheets to help you out with more details on mole trapping if you're, you're interested. There's also a toxicant that's out there more recently on the market, uh, and there are a couple of them that are available that uh, appeal to some of the natural activities of these moles. Moles typically feed on earthworms and insects, and you see this, what looks like an earthworm, it's actually a plastic worm and it's been been impregnated with uh, essence of earthworms, so it smells like a worm, and it's also been impregnated with difasinone, which is a toxicant that is registered for controlling moles. So it's a toxicant that will kill moles, um, and and it's another tool that you can use in your toolbox for dealing with these animals. Um, Just a comment on on frightening devices for moles and pocket gophers. They don't seem to be very good, uh, very effective. Things that create vibrations, magnetic fields, sonic, subsonic, whatever, they don't seem to be all that effective in dealing with with our ground-dwelling animals. Moving on here, um, trees and shrubs. 
uh, we're getting close to the end on my my topics here, but trees and shrubs, these are our uh, resources we really value. In some circumstances, we may use trees and shrubs uh, or protect them with eight-foot-high woven wire fences. Probably not the case in people's backyards, but that's kind of the Cadillac of our fencing approach. But you can see such circumstances where you plant a new tree in the backyard and you might want to install a cylinder of hardware cloth or in a case of of over here, we see a tree shelter that can be installed, and these can protect the trees from voles, from rabbits, uh, from deer, so long as it hasn't grown out beyond the top of that. And But you get a lot of different protection, and it also can help to protect the tree and help it grow in, in more dry conditions. With uh, the repellents we spoke of before, there's one repellent that has been proven effective and four research studies that I'm aware of, and it's always proven to be the most effective of the repellents. It's called Deer Away. The active ingredient in it is putrescent egg. It's rotten eggs. And you'll find that there are many different products out there on the market that also are using rotten eggs and garlic and capsaicin, the hot sauce-like material. And these various mixtures can work. And uh, Deer Away just has scientifically been proven to be the most effective of the repellents. Unfortunately, it's only registered for the use on, uh, on, tor on trees or dormant fruit trees. And so the application of, of the product is relatively limited. Um, how about boneyards? What do we do? And what am I talking about? Well, some people's backyards look something like this. We see backyards with stuff, debris all over the place, and this is wildlife habitat, especially for some of our invasive species like house mice and Norway rats. This is not what we want to have. So we want to avoid situations like that. So we, you know, rock piles wood piles, brush piles, debris like this laying around in proximity to our structures can be a real problem because they can attract those unwanted visitors and those have ways of chewing into our structures. So we want to minimize any type of uh, these what I call boneyards that, uh, that can cause problems in the backyards. Um, having neat, orderly type planned gardens and, and backyard settings, landscapes like this can go a long way as far as is uh, minimizing impacts by wildlife. Uh, the last one I have for you is with pets. We all love pets. We, we, uh, we feed and we care for our pets. Challenge can come where some people like to feed them outdoors in the back, uh, on the back stoop. Um, and, and if you leave pet food out overnight, if you provide far more food than what the pets can feed on, it'll serve as an attract in some of our unwanted guests as well, uh, unwanted visitors. So skunks and raccoons can cause problems like this. So it's a matter of providing enough food that the dog can feed appropriately and then removing that food so that attractant isn't continuously there. I'll also make some mention about uh, about cats and uh, the the issue that we deal with with free ranging cats. Uh, they kill millions of birds every year, and so my message is to proper uh, proper ownership and management of of cats uh, and proper feeding and care of cats. Uh, we can protect our wildlife resources. We can protect our pets if we care for them responsibly. With that, I'm just going to wrap things up with the idea of human-wildlife coexistence. That's what we're all striving for. And so we can attract wildlife to our backyards. We can also, by proper means of prevention and control of wildlife damage, we can live with wildlife in our backyards and in our lives as well. And so it's been a joy to be able to talk with you today. I do know that we have some time here to address some of the questions, so I'm going to invite Danny back on the air here, and uh, we'll chat a little bit more about wildlife in the backyards. Hey, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. It kind of sounds like food, water, and shelter is the most important part of the integrated wildlife management, whether you're, you know, you're trying to attract them or control the damage. It goes both ways. That's right. It's a double-edged so we'll sword. If, open up for questions. If, if anybody has a question, if you could please use the, the chat box on the left-hand side, and we'll try to get those questions answered. So, Danny, uh, do you want to pick out questions for me? I am looking right now to see. I see a lot of them there. <laughs> so uh, I see one. Uh, Vicky says, boneyards also attract rats, mice, ants, and mosquitoes. Absolutely. Yep. And so it's just a matter of oftentimes public health, protecting public health by having those boneyards out there, dishes that can collect water, the mosquitoes then lay eggs, and then you have mosquito larvae and the potential for disease transmission. Ooh, problems. So clean up proper sanitation, removing the structure that may, may be out there that provides habitat for those unwanted 
uh, visitors, it goes a long way. Let's see, Miss Nancy has a question. I think she's wanting to know what kind of advice she could give her neighbor who puts food out for the deer. <laughs> well, there's a challenge um, because you have differing opinions, perhaps. Um, you, on one side of the fence, you have uh, plants that you want to protect, trees and shrubs, uh, and you don't want deer in your backyard, perhaps, and you have a neighbor who loves to see the deer, and so they put food out for that uh, for deer. Um, you know, actually, many states have made it illegal to feed deer now uh, because of the potential for transmitting diseases and uh, the, the potential impacts that it can have on deer populations in general. So that's one angle is there's a potential for a legal aspect. There's also a, an aspect here about uh, being neighborly. Uh, they may not recognize that you have a problem with deer that are coming through your yard and eating on your plants to get to their feeder. And sometimes it's just a matter of communicating with your neighbors, and they'll say, oh, I didn't realize that. And they may reduce the feeding, or they may place their feeders in a different place to get the deer changing their movements, and you may be able to resolve it easily. Sometimes, and I've experienced this, you may have situations where the people just love the deer, they don't love you as much, and they don't care. <laughs> and then you have a challenge, you have a conflict, and, and hopefully there will be better ways of resolving that. That that can be life, too. Hey, I've had a, another question come in, and this is on human hair and soap. Yeah, I'm human hair and soap. They, they mentioned <laughs> apple, so I'm assuming this is, you know, sometimes you see apple orchards and different types of orchards, and you a lot of times you can find soap or, or some, type of, some type of hair hanging from the trees. Yes. Yeah, that's right. And and the idea is they're using these as repellents, and oftentimes they're available essentially for free. A lot of times uh, motels and hotels will give away the bar soap that isn't fully used, or uh, barbershops will give away the clippings of the hair, and so you can bag it up and you can hang those from trees. And, uh, you know, I actually did research on this about 30 years ago, <laughs> testing different soaps and hair, and we found under high deer pressures coming into apple orchards that, they didn't work at all. And so I had just worked up a publication and submitted it through our extension network, and I was saying about how they do not work in controlling deer. And then I moved to Nebraska, and uh, the, about a week after I moved to Nebraska, one of our foresters who had a tree farm, he had tried soap for uh, soap on a rope to control, and he was very successful in controlling deer. So here I am, having done research, saying that soap and hair does not work, and my friend, Forrester, who wrote an article, and he's writing and reporting on different information. And so my point is, is that with soap and hair and many repellents, you have variable effectiveness. For some people, it'll work. That's great. For other people, it doesn't work at all. And for a person in extension, that's where my problem comes, is that it takes years to build credibility but I can lose my credibility in an instant. If I say a repellent will work and it doesn't, you know, that word gets passed around that, oh, that tastes to me, he doesn't know what he's talking about. So that's why I always qualify these answers about soap and human hair and repellents in general. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. We don't have much control over that. Thank you. Do we have any other questions that we could, or anyone has anything to add? How to oh, avoid critters? Of... Go ahead. I see one about how to avoid critters in the compost bin. Ah, that's that's a good one. Um, with compost bins, you know, you want to be composting vegetable matter, and some people will make the mistake of putting animal matter into compost bins. And so they'll put fats and uh, meat trimmings and things like that, even bones in, because they're thinking, well, you have uh, calcium sources, you know, minerals, etc. Well, those animal fats and uh, proteins will attract a lot of your, your mid-sized uh, predators and scavengers like raccoons and skunks and other animals of that nature, opossums. And so for compost bins, I, I usually recommend avoiding any animal type uh, proteins or fats in those bins. Now vegetables, they will also attract some of those, those animals, but you can greatly reduce attractiveness of compost bins by keeping the animal products out. And we have another one that says, have you had people that have used mothballs for snake control or mice control? 
what can you tell them to get them to stop using them? Oh, there. Well, I was going to say you shouldn't use those. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, the, the mothballs, whether it be in attics for bats to repel bats or in basements to repel, um, there has been work done that indicates that you have to have such a high concentration of paradichlorobenzene, uh, one of the active ingredients in mothballs, that it actually becomes a human health hazard. And so from the human health perspective, we do not recommend the use of mothballs as a repellent. Um, and a lot of people use mothballs in outdoor environments. And, and I was speaking from an indoor environment. In outdoor environments, they'll place mothballs around the perimeter of a garden or something like that. And uh, I, don't, I don't have any research that backs this, but I would just say that in most environments, the wind blows. And the volatile agent, the paradichlorobenzene that's in the air, the atmosphere that's supposed to be repelling the rabbits, well, it's blown away as quickly as it's volatilized. And so it's just not an effective tool. And we have so many other more effective tools. If you'd invest the same amount of money in mothballs as you would in some of the more recommended techniques, you'd be much better ahead. Great. Thank you. And let's see, what is your opinion of the systemic tablets that cause plants to taste like hot peppers? The systemic tablets. Um, you know, I, I don't have any personal experience with those. Um, I, I'm aware of some that have come out, and, and I like, personally, I like the idea of synthetic uh, or, or um, uh, systematic type repellents. There was a product that came out in the market um, that... Uh, was its active ingredient, it was absorbed into the cell walls. And uh, it, it was to be one of the most bitter substances known to humans, actually. Bitrex was the name of the product. And it was to be held within the cell walls. And so, therefore, I thought, oh, this is great. It's something that won't be washed away in the rain. Unfortunately, that chemical compound was not repellent to deer or rabbits. And so it just wasn't effective. Really unfortunate. It was effective to humans because humans could taste it, rats could taste it, um, raccoons could taste it, and so they found different ways of using it. With the systemic tablets, Repellex, it, this is the one I'm reading now, that cause plants to have a taste like hot peppers. That, you know, I can't comment directly because of my personal, limited personal experience with it. It surprises me that a plant could take up capsaicin, which is the active ingredient of, of hot peppers, because capsaicin is a pretty big molecule, and uh, plants with water, they're not able to uptake these large molecules. So I don't want to be overly critical, because I don't personally know, but I, I have, I'm skeptical of, of that. Okay, thank you. And, and there's another one that came in through a private chat, and it was about repelling bats in the attic with light. Yeah, repelling bats in the attic with light, it's, it's a technique you can use. And if you think about it, bats go into attics and belfries and bell towers because they're typically uh, quiet, the air is still, and they're very dark, especially our attics. And so that's what they're seeking is that, that protective environment. So if you were to string uh, lights in an attic, turn on a house fan, and plug in a radio, <laughs> essentially you're working against all of those features that bats are trying to avoid. And again, this is a case where I don't have any scientific evidence of this. This is something that hasn't been tested. But, but uh, intellectually, you think that something like that should work. And I do know that private uh, contractors do this type of activity when they're called to home. They'll, they'll set up fans, they'll set up lights in an attic for an initial starter to try and encourage the bats to move out. You can also benefit this by putting on one-way doors onto those holes that, they add, that the bats are accessing coming in and out of the house. And so you can have these little one-way cones or netting materials so that the bats, when they do go out, then they can't get back in. And you use this for a while. Uh, so that you're, you're sure that all the bats are out, and then you can seal up those halls so the bats can't get back in. One word of caution with this, though, is that we don't want to exclude bats from an attic when they are actively maintaining their young. And so we have maternal colonies that will get established in an attic, and what I typically will say is June to July, let them fly. Don't exclude bats from an attic between June and July because that's when they're raising their young, 
And if you excluded bats, then you would be keeping mothers from getting to their babies. You'd have baby bats crawling all over, and it's a very inhumane way of dealing with bats. So live with them through those summer months. Once you get into August, September, those bats are typically going to want to move out anyway. And then you can use the one-way doors and the different techniques to get them moved out to another place. Great. I, I see I see another one, and this might be hard to answer, but you may have some suggestions. It says, I have a 3 by 6 I'm not uh, inches, 3 by 6 inch fresh hole next to my back door. The external dirt pile is noted. Or, no, I'm sorry, there is no external dirt pile. What could it be? Ooh, no external dirt pile by a 3 by 6 inch hole. Hmm, that is a little curious. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes we just don't have the answers, and this is a case that I'd probably want to take a look at a photograph, uh, get a little better sense of perhaps what other sign might be about there, because usually an animal that digs that large of a burrow, where I would be thinking of, uh, and I don't know where this person is from, but I'd be thinking of a woodchuck, a badger, uh, potentially even a coyote, a uh, red fox, um, and these are larger animals, but they typically leave piles of, of soil outside of that open burrow. Um, this is a tricky one. Uh, we have ground squirrels that typically don't have piles of soil outside because they don't want to be detected, and so they'll just burrow a hole, but those holes are only usually about an inch and a half uh, in, in, uh, in diameter. So I'm, I don't have a good answer for you right now. could be a neighborhood kid who's just messing with you. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any more questions, or um, Dr. Hingstrom, can you see anything I'm not seeing? Uh, um, I see I... comments on sudden onset onset lead poisoning. <laughs> I'm sure we're talking about shooting there. Um, Shooting is a, a technique that I recommend as far as a control technique uh, when you consider all uh, the full variety of control techniques. We have non-lethal, which means exclusion, repellents, fencing, toxicant, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, even fertility control, frightening devices, habitat modification, and we have lethal control methods, toxicants, trapping, and, and removal, uh, and, and shooting. And by use of integrated pest management, you consider all of those tools. And in some situations, in some locations, the lethal control techniques are not going to be in play. In others, they are. And so I, I hate to see us throw out tools when our toolbox is small enough the way it is. So that's just a general comment about the use of all of those control techniques. Consider it from your own personal perspective, from your community's perspective, and then consider which ones are best for the situation. Right. Does anyone else, we're, we have a few, just a couple of minutes left if there are any more questions. Okay. I see one here about uh, uh, do Norwegian rats or Norway rats dig burrows? Absolutely. Yep, they're burrowing rodents, and uh, they regularly will dig burrows. Usually there will be some type of overhead structure, so I've had rats dig burrows underneath uh, sheets of metal, underneath dog houses, underneath uh, concrete slabs. Uh, very, very common for rats to dig burrows. Uh, any, comment any from... Help? Comment from Vicki, be mindful of local laws when using firearms, bows, crossbows, toxicants, any of the lethal control techniques. Absolutely. You always have to look at the legal aspects. Always look at the label because the legal, label is a legal document if you're using a toxicant and repellent, and you have to use those tools and abide by the label. Great information, and I know the, the game wardens will appreciate that as well. <laughs> Certainly. I'm seeing a lot of comments about great presentation, and, and I have to agree. This was, this was certainly great, Dr. Hingstrom. We thank you so much for sharing this information. Um, and thank you all who helped to moderate. Uh, Dr. Hingstrom, we can look back at the surveys later to see if anybody has taken any additional questions. And I wanted to remind everybody that the uh, 2016 webinar series is, is up with the uh, presentations for next year. So, Dr. Hingstrom, thank you. It's been my pleasure. I do enjoy these, and I, I hope people have benefited from it. And thank you all who joined in today. We'll see you next year.
good day.